This is Chief Inspector Jack Pachuda, MysteriesOnTheNet.com. I'm in the speakeasy and theater of the Brumder Mansion here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Murder mysteries are performed here. And in fact, if you write a good murder mystery plot, who knows, you could have your mystery performed right here in the speakeasy at the Brumder Mansion. We're winding down our murder mystery writing program. And I have a few more points to make, and then we're through. Let's talk a little bit about the timeline. When you are creating a timeline in your murder mystery, there are several things you need to consider. Two very important points. Number one, when was the body found? Now, we talked about where the body was, the things around the body. But when was the body found? And number two is the time of death. Sometimes when the body was found and the time of death are consistent. For instance, you could write a murder mystery plot where someone actually dies in front of everyone. We know what the time of death was. We know when the body was found. But sometimes the body is found after the murder is committed. So those two are, two are very important points. The time of death and when the body is found. Then you need to create a timeline for each suspect with key points around those two very important points in time. And in my super secret murder mystery writing system, I've got a matrix that enables you to do this. I need you to pinpoint where the main suspects are at those key points in time and at other points in time that are involved in the mystery. I talked about additional storylines. They come into play again. Here's how. Now that you've identified the suspects, now that you know who the, who the victim is, you can round out all the information in those additional storylines. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to create an overview of each storyline in no more than two sentences. I want you to narrow it down. I want you to make sense of it as to what's going on between those two, three, or four suspects who are involved in the case. So list the suspects, give their names, and also tell how they are involved. What is their involvement in the plot and, and how do they interact? How do they know each other in that one individual storyline? What's the victim's role in that storyline? They met the victim or the victim had some influence over that part of the plot. So the victim has an involvement too. You need to list that, that involvement. What clues could you put in to your plot that lead to that storyline. So you can't just come right out and say it. You've got to have some indication that that is a different storyline and that different people are involved. Think about the clues that would lead to it and think about this. Some of those storylines, two or three of them, will hit a brick wall. They're not real. They're not going to lead to solving the case. What can you build in and at what point do you build them in? What, what uh, kinds of barriers, what kinds of roadblocks will your investigators arrive at that will say, hey, this is the wrong way to go. I'm going down the wrong path. I've got to turn around and go back because this storyline's not going to let me solve the case. And that's where my friend the red herring comes back in. Because in those storylines, you're going to have red herrings. And those red herrings are going to lead your investigators down that path for a while, but eventually they're going to prove to be the false path and they'll turn around and come back. I mentioned clues. Let's talk a little bit about clues because, because clues are what, what you're going to build your mystery around. What are clues? Clues are letters. It could be a letter from a police chief, a chief inspector, somebody in the government, uh, maybe some governmental agency. They could be a letter from a lover. They could be a letter from an informant. Some kind of letter could be a clue. Now, not everything in that letter has to lead directly to solving the case. Some of them, again, could be red herrings. You can also have a series of written clues. In the murder mystery kits that I sell online at mysteriesonthenet.com, I have a series of clues that are given out to people as they arrive. I call them the gossip mill. Here's why. They're little bits of information, some true, some false, that get the, the people to start to interact with each other. Because once they start to talk, they start to build momentum. And when they build that momentum, they start to solve the case. What about newspapers? I love to build in newspapers into murder mysteries. You can have a, 
a murder mystery that has stories about some of the suspects. You can have true stories about the suspects, true in the sense that they, they are involved in the plot, and of course, red herring is built into those stories too. Those newspapers could include a variety of things. Sometimes it'll be a diagram. Sometimes it'll be a picture. I have included clues in things like obituaries in newspapers or in classified columns, personal messages to another suspect. And you've got to figure out who the people are who are talking to each other via the newspaper. What about police reports? A series of police reports even. One here, one there, dropped at critical moments. You may have your chief inspector or your police chief or whoever is, is solving the case for you, uh, in charge of solving the case. Tell people facts that are found out at a specific interval during the course of the mystery. And of course, a coroner's report. A coroner's report is always good because it gives a time of death. It gives a cause of death. It gives a lot of information about markings on the body, things that were found out during the autopsy. Coded message. In one of my mysteries, I have a coded message. It's a message that is found on a beach. And that message can be decoded only by following one of the clues. One of the clues gives the key for decoding the message and helping to solve the case. Another example, I, I have a golf mystery in which the golf card, the, the scorecard is a clue. Some of the markings on the scorecard, some of the scores, who scored a hole in one, when, when was the hole in one scored? They are clues as to what happened on the golf course. In another of my mysteries, I built in clues on a wine bottle label. You know, there's a front and a back and some of the images and some of the writing on both sides of that bottle can be a clue. I call that mystery, death is a Cabernet, old chum. And the label on the bottle of Cabernet has clues. What about articles written by the victim or letters written by the victim before the victim was murdered? Now the articles could have appeared in a professional trade magazine and in that professional trade magazine the victim alludes to things that are happening in his or her life. What about a last will and testament? That's always a good one. And you could recruit somebody from your audience to play an attorney and read that last will and testament to everybody else. And of course, in that, that will, you're going to build in some indications about what happened. I like newscasts. What about a simulated newscast? You could have somebody record it in advance. It is played the night of your mystery and there are clues inside the newscast. Or a sign here or there, something that might be in the newspaper something that might appear someplace else. The clues that you construct have a very important dynamic attached to them. You need to know how they are revealed and when they are revealed because the points at which they are revealed during the course of the mystery will help determine whether or not the mystery is solved at the correct time. Remember, I told you before, at 75% of the way through the mystery, you want the smoking gun clue to appear. Keep that in mind. So when they are revealed and how they are revealed are two very important dynamics in constructing all of those clues that lead to solving the case. So two final points. And these final points conclude the entire way that we put together your murder mystery party. Number one, I want you to understand the critical path and I want you to diagram it and list it. The critical path that reveals the fact that only this person, only the perpetrator of the crime, only the one that you identified could have committed it and equally as important, give me one reason why everybody else, one reason why every other suspect could not have committed it. And I'll tell you why. I've been doing this for a long time and people who get the answer wrong will frequently argue with you to try to prove that they're right and you're wrong. So that's it. That's the way to write the perfect murder mystery party. We've taken you from my seven secrets all the way to constructing the conclusion. So here's what you need to do. You need to get to work. And if you want to, buy my writing system. You can buy it online at mysteriesonthenet.com. 
under writing system and you can fill in all the blanks and at the end you will have a murder mystery party that your friends will love and that you will enjoy saying I wrote it. Have a wonderful time sleuthing and I hope to see you at the Brumder Mansion.